I'm going to try today to tell you about some of the things we're doing in my group, um, looking forward for the next stage of uh, deep learning, uh, incorporating aspects that I think are crucial and missing that have to do with high level cognition. So if you, all right, so now we, um, we're going to go to the slides. Um, and it, it, it also addresses some fundamental questions in machine learning that seem to be having nothing to do with cognition, but I think have a lot to do. And that is the question of generalization out of distribution, in other words, beyond the distribution of the training set. So the training set uh, is an empirical distribution, but it's sampled from some distribution that is unknown. Usually machine learning focuses on uh, how we can generalize to test examples from the same distribution as the training distribution. Uh, so the test distribution is the same as the training distribution, but um, in the real world, uh, things are different. Uh, the world changes. We maybe collect data in one country and then we deploy it in a different country and things like this. So there are these non-stationarities, there are these uh, transfer problems and so on. And our current learning theory is not adequate for dealing with that. Um, one way to think about this, uh, which has inspired me a lot, is the question of systematic generalization. Um, this is something that humans are able to do, and it's been studied a lot in linguistics, but you see in the picture there, uh, it applies to visual structure as well, where we can make sense of the, the vehicle in the bottom by thinking about existing vehicles we know. Uh, even though it's the first time we see this and it's maybe an improbable vehicle, well, we can still kind of make sense of it. And the idea of systematic generalization is that we can dynamically, in other words, on the fly, as you know, as we experience things or think about new things, we combine existing concepts in, in, in combinations we've never seen and maybe don't even correspond to the training distribution. So for example, if you read a science fiction scenario, it's not something that could happen probably. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they make crazy assumptions about going faster than the speed of light or whatever. Um, but you understand the the, uh, the scenario, you understand the, the novel, the movie or whatever. Um, and, and humans are very good at this kind of thing. Uh, you can go and drive in a completely new city where the traffic laws are different. And, uh, you know, it may, you, you may need some adaptation and uh, I'll try to convince you that your brain actually will be behaving in a different way than where you're, when you're driving in your home city, but you can do it. Uh, whereas there's a number of studies suggesting that uh, current deep learning, current state of the art in machine learning, you know, all over, isn't uh, doing that great. Uh, so there's this notion of overfitting the training distribution. So normally in machine learning, we think about overfitting the training set. Uh, and here, researchers in the last few years have been thinking, okay, so it's not just that we're overfitting the training set, we, we, we might not be overfitting the training set, uh, we might be uh, generalizing well in the training distribution, so test examples from the same distribution as the training set, but, but actually a different distribution, which maybe has the same underlying something, uh, we're not doing well. And then, so there's a kind of overfitting to a distribution rather than just two particular examples. So what can we do? Because if you, you know, just ask, can I generalize to any other distribution? Of course not. I mean, like it, it could be arbitrary, different from the distribution you were trained on. So there's going to be some additional assumptions if we go out of the usual IID assumption that this is going to be the same distribution. Um, what 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 extra assumptions? I mean, what assumptions would replace the IID assumption? Something weaker, right? And um, and and some of the threads of my talk today are about well, uh, how do humans do it? First of all, uh, can we get inspiration from that? Because they seem to be much better at machines at doing that. And also thinking about well, fundamentally, what is it that changes and what is it that is the same across those changes in distribution that we care about? And uh, one interesting angle on this is knowledge. So there, there, there are aspects of knowledge which are like the laws of physics that don't change where, wherever you go. You go to a different planet, 
same laws. Um, so if you think in classical AI, you had like facts and rules. So you can think of like rules of the thing that are stationary and, and facts are the thing that like the values of variables basically um, or the events and, and that, that could be very different. The distribution of these things could be very different. So, so let's look at what humans do when they face novel or rare situations. Well, they call upon conscious attention and they're able to use their imagination somehow to come up with new solutions to problems, to reason with the pieces of knowledge they already have, but in, in, in combinations that were not necessary in the past, but suddenly, you know, maybe the right thing to do or to think about. In, in the new context. So, so psychologists have really made a difference between um, the way we uh, do cognition in our like habitual behavior, like driving in your hometown and you know your usual uh, driving route versus driving um, in, a, in a completely different environment. So uh, yeah, so let's say for example, you're You've been uh, driving uh, in a country where people drive on the right, and suddenly you you have to go to a country where people drive on the left. Um, you, you can see for yourself that the way uh, your 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 uh, condition works uh, in those two cases are very different. For example, if it's your habitual route, you can uh, do other things at the same time. Uh, you don't need to attend so much to the road, although you should in case something happens. Uh, but the truth is people will like, listen to the radio, talk to someone else and so on. If you're driving in this uh, city where people drive on the other side of the road and it's the first time you do that, I can tell you, you don't want to listen to radio or, or have somebody talk to you. And, and there's more than this attention thing. Um, it looks like the kind of knowledge and the kind of computation that is being touched upon um, are different. Uh, and there's an analogy here with uh, what people like Daniel Kahneman call system one and system two, which basically you can divide into the unconscious computation and the conscious computation. So the, the unconscious computation is intuitive. Everything we do uh, that may be very complex, but happens very fast, and we don't have access to the details of how it happened. Where the knowledge about how you recognize a cat is, is intuitive. And you can't really explain it very well. The knowledge of how you drive is implicit, right? Um, and most of current deep learning is like this. It allows us to solve these kinds of problems pretty well. But, but it's not so good at uh, these other problems where um, we humans would, would, would you know, think through things in a sequential way. We, we, we have these thoughts that involve very few entities at a time. So we can verbalize them, uh, we can plan, we can reason, and, and the knowledge that is being manipulated seems to be communicable, so it's explicit. So we'd like deep learning to encompass these things too, because we think that it may help us with systematic generalization uh, by um, uh, facilitating this uh, uh, skill of uh, recombining existing concepts uh, and not uh, uh, sort of factorization allows to generalize combinatorially and, and, and thus uh, deal with these completely new situations. So attention, as I said, is, a, is an important ingredient. So what is it about? If you use two classical neural nets, there is no such thing. Um, but uh, what we found in uh, uh, 2014, 2015 is that if you're trying to do some tasks, uh, really you want to focus on a few elements. It doesn't mean you ignore the other ones, but there's like much stronger focus on a few elements. So if you do machine translation, for example, you, you want to pay really special attention to the one or two words in the source sentence that is uh, going to be translated almost word for word in, in the targets in, in the output sen sentence. Uh, of course, you, you need the context and all that, but, but it, it doesn't play such a strong role. So this ability to focus on a few elements at a time in order to reason, um, to, um, uh, to, to uh, process information sequentially like, like humans do, is something we didn't know how to do very well. Uh, there were a few attempts uh, before, 
But but really, that paper um, from uh, 2015 has been a turning point. It it's led to first revolution in machine translation in terms of performance, and then in general in NLP with the advent of transformers, which I'm sure you you're uh, you're aware of, uh, and and it's essentially a generalization of that scheme over multiple stages um, that um, also allow us to. Um, rethink what a neural net is. It's not just operating on vectors, like the traditional NLPs, but operating on sets, sets that are structured as um, uh, key value pairs, where the key is used to decide what element is going to be focused on. And the value is the content uh, that the attention is, is drawing upon to, the, to do the next computation. So, uh, of course, attention is, is something we do, and it's connected very closely, but different from the notion of consciousness. I already talked about conscious processing and unconscious processing. So it's good to look at what the um, uh, sort of dominant theories about consciousness are in neuroscience and, and cognitive science. And uh, the one theory that I think uh, really um, uh, gets that... Uh, a uh, very high level of recognition uh, and probably dominates the field. This is called the global workspace theory or the neuronal workspace theory. Um, it, it was proposed in the 80s and 90s and extended more recently by a neuroscientist like Stan Dehen. Um, and one of its core tenets, and you can experience it yourself by a little bit of introspection, is that there is a bottleneck of conscious processing. The, essentially your working memory. You, you can only hold in your mind a handful of things, you know, the seven plus or minus two thing, right? So uh, why do we have such a bottleneck? I mean, the, the brain has huge amounts of, um, of hardware. Um, of course, you can't connect every neuron to any every, every other neuron, but it's more than that, okay? It's a... It's much more uh, constrained than um, the um, possibilities of wiring in the brain would suggest. And, and my theory is it's because it brings um, a, uh, an inductive bias that helps us to model high-level uh, knowledge of the kind that we manipulate consciously. So I'll come back to that. Now, uh, consciousness is also connected to thoughts, of course, that's uh, the content of consciousness, and language, because we typically translate our thoughts into language and vice versa. When I speak, you know, it creates images in your mind. Um, it's not exactly like a one-to-one -one mapping, but it's, uh, it's a pretty strong mapping, close to one-to-one. -to -one. Um, and... Um, that being said, language is like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it, it's not like we have on one hand the system one intuitive system, and we either do that or we reason um, at a level that's uh, verbalizable. Um, the two are intimately tied together, entangled together, one helping the other. Um, in particular, all of perception is, um, is you know, mostly handled at the system one level, the intuitive level. That's why we're doing so well in perception with deep learning. But um, one hypothesis that we're pursuing in my group is that uh, system one is also involved in helping system two, like the reasoning part, do its job. Otherwise it just couldn't, it would be too expensive to search in an exponential number of possibilities. And so I think uh, in the future, we will see more success in terms of systems that understand language, uh, understand the underlying common sense um, when they have been trained, not just on texts, but also in a, what we call a grounded language learning way that connects um, linguistic utterances with what they point to, like words point to what uh, things in the world, uh, like you know, which we, which we can perceive with images, for example. All right, so at a high level, the kinds of questions I'm asking um, 
uh, can be seen as pushing the deep learning objective. The deep learning objective, as I and others in the in the early 2000s uh, conceived of it, was about learning a hierarchy of representations with the higher levels of representation capturing the most abstract aspects of, of the data. Um, and so that begs the question, you know, what, what are these uh, representations at the top level? What should they represent? Uh, and one of the answers I'll, I'll, I'll try to propose today is uh, that they have a causal interpretation. And I'll come back to that. Um, so we, we want to uh, also not just discover these high-level concepts in a, maybe in an unsupervised way, but also figure out how they are related to each other. So unlike a lot of the thinking that I think has been going in the wrong direction for over a decade uh, around the concept of disentangling, uh, disentangling these high-level concepts, uh, I don't think that these uh, high-level variables should be independent, statistically speaking. In fact, it's really important to understand how they are related to each other, maybe through a causal model. So, so really what we're trying to do is jointly learn the system one part, uh, in which, among other things, transforms the low-level things like images into the high-level things like um, you know, the sort of concepts you would name with language. Uh, but but also how these high level things are related to each other. Okay, and um, one of the lessons from uh, a lot of theory work in the last few years is you can't do that uh, unless you add extra assumptions. In, in other words, there is a what's called an identifiability problem that there are many high level representations that could be consistent with low level observations. Uh, so, like, we don't know which one to pick, and maybe it does make a difference. In fact, the uh, whole lot of the theory on causality says it does make a difference. Like, if you pick one uh, causal understanding um, uh, versus another, it may be that you will predict the consequences of interventions, which are actions at the high level, if you want, uh, differently. And then this is uh, this is uh, extremely important because this is what's going to determine your ability to generalize in in uh, completely novel settings. I'll come. I'll try to explain that. So first of all, um, at a high level, and sort of sticking with this idea of causality and the physics intuition, uh, I want to throw this um, very simple physics-inspired notion. Um, that in order to go beyond the ID assumption, we're going to just weaken that assumption by saying there are things that are preserved, that are invariant, you know, whatever uh, environment you're in, and these are the causal mechanisms. These are like the laws of physics, and they may be stochastic, right? So the world obeys some stochastic dynamical system, and you'd like to understand how the world works. Now, you have to be careful because understanding how the world works doesn't tell you what the distribution of the data should be because it may depend on initial conditions. For example, the same laws of physics give rise to um, you know, a diversity of pictures that we can see on Earth, but a very different kind of distribution of pictures that we can see on the moon. It's the same laws of physics, just initial conditions are different. right? So, so I think that's, that's a useful way of uh, trying to draw the boundary between things that can change from one environment to the next and things that don't. Um, and, and, and that is more powerful than, I mean, it, it's weaker, so it, it, it uh, allows to extend uh, to a broader set of problems, the IID assumption that we usually have in machine learning. Okay, so let's talk more about causality and how it may help us to build systems that can generalize out of distribution. Um, and for that, I need to talk about the notion of intervention. Um, so the idea of intervention is interesting, and uh, it's kind of um, almost a philosophical aspect of the theory of causality. Um, the idea is, like in the picture, that there may be a default causal flow of things, but an agent, can do something, which we're going to call an intervention, that's going to break that flow. So, you know, maybe the, the ball was falling and it would have fallen on the floor, except I caught it. Or maybe the, 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 
the glass that's standing beside me, uh, you know, would have stayed on the table, except I could have pushed it and it would fell, it would fall on, on the ground. So you can see these interventions, they're a kind of redirection of causal mechanisms. And why does it help us out of distribution? Because maybe the kind of interventions we see that have created the training data may be different from the kind of interventions that may happen in a different environment. So it's like my Earth versus Moon example. So, but, but if we can discover the underlying mechanisms that are shared across both environments, then we really have a good chance to generalizing out of distribution. So what we need here is a good world model. And a world model you can have to think of like in, in reinforcement learning, like in model-based reinforcement learning as something that allows us to predict what would be the effect of interventions or the effect of actions of, of agents, okay? Um, now, I wanna go back to the idea that we need assumptions, uh, additional assumptions beside the IID assumption and uh, the connection with human cognition. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, if you remember, I was talking about this bottleneck um, and saying that maybe the, that bottleneck constraint forces our brain uh, at the level of the, uh, the variables that are being manipulated uh, in, in our in this through this bottleneck, the, the high level variables, it forces uh, something about the joint distribution of these variables. And, and what I'm going to claim is it forces uh, sparse dependencies. Right. So this may be um, a particular form of uh, assumption that's only true for the high level uh, variables. Um, the verbalizable knowledge, but not necessarily for everything we know. For example, that sparse dependency assumption maybe doesn't make sense at the low level of uh, you know perceptual processing. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Um, so um, one thing that I've been trying to do is to clarify you know what could be these assumptions. You can think of them as like uh, scientific theories about what humans may exploit about the world, or at least, you know, it might not be a perfectly correct assumption about the world, but it's one that humans exploit successfully. And if we build intelligent machines that have intelligence similar to humans, or at least as good as humans, we probably want to exploit these priors, these, these uh, inductive biases. So let, let's uh, try to go through some of them. All right, so, so the first one is the one I've already talked about, so that, uh, the idea that the, the statistical dependencies between these abstract variables are sparse. What does it mean they're sparse? I mean uh, um, that you can make predictions, say on one variable, like uh, the position of the ball next, from very few other variables, like the position of the ball just before and the fact that I drop it. And we can see that in language. Like We write sentences like, if I drop the ball, it will fall on the ground. And you notice how many variables are there? Like maybe, you know, depending on your count, but uh, three, four or something, a handful, uh, not a million. Yet at the level of pixels, there may be a million pixels involved in the little movie of this. So um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, that constraint of sparse dependencies, that, that, that an abstract outcome can be predicted accurately from very few conditioning abstract variables, only works for this high level abstract level. It doesn't work at the low level. So in other words, these, these inductive biases don't have to be true for everything, but there will be a set of aspects of the world for which it, they work well. And in a way that's sort of a self-definition of what becomes high level and what is low level. Um, what other assumptions? Well, I already mentioned it. Um, uh, I think that these high-level variables uh, can uh, have something to do with causality. So if you look in natural language, each word uh, somehow plays a role in a kind of causal story. You have uh, variables that play the role of cause, of effect, of agent, uh, of action, of intervention, of a mode of operation, like how, when, you know, 
is it related and so on. It's not all like this, but like a vast majority of the semantic content seems to be fitting that picture. Um, and um, yeah, and, and also language allows us to do things that seem a little bit odd in a purely statistical picture of things. Uh, and that is what we do with imagination, which uh, people in Kazali call counterfactuals. In other words, you can um, imagine things that have not happened yet or may never happen or could have happened but didn't happen. So that sort of thing um, is natural in the language of causality. And it's not necessarily obvious uh, how to do, like, uh, think about this otherwise. Um, another really, really important assumption, which we can also grasp thinking about physics, is that those causal relationships, which, uh, you know, uh, we call causal mechanism. We call them causal mechanisms by opposition to causal relationship because the same type of relationship, the same mechanism, in other words, can be used in many instances. I could drop the ball, but I could as well drop the phone. I mean, it's better to drop the ball than drop the phone, but but I can do it, right? So uh, there is this notion that's important in machine learning that you will have parameter sharing, like the same piece of neural net that defines the sort of dropping mechanism and it could be applied to any kind of object. And so I need maybe some attention machinery to direct on the fly, oh, this mechanism is going to be applied to this object and that object, but maybe you know five minutes later, I'm going to apply it to a different set of uh, arguments. Um, and, and that enables systematic generalization, right? Because we, I, you know, it's like verbs and, and objects and subjects. I can replace the object here. Like if I had dropped the Zog, it would have fallen on the ground. I, I don't know what a Zog is, but, but, but because of the context, I've replaced the object in this context by this word. I, I can now infer lots of things about a Zog. It's something small enough I can hold in my hand, for example. Uh, and, and that has mass that, you know, would make it fall if I drop it. Um, so, so we get this systematic generalization because of the reusability of the mechanisms. Um, another assumption, which my group has only recently started to throw in, and of course, people in classical AI have been, you know, focused on that for a long time. And that's the idea that these high level concepts maybe not always, but often have a discrete or symbolic nature. And of course we see that in language, but again, even in language, you, you, you have non-discrete things like prosody. If I speak slowly or, you know, with some thing in my voice, um, it can carry information in a continuous spectrum. But anyways, um, there is a lot of discreteness. And one hypothesis that we have uh, explored in a recent paper, I'll talk about briefly later, is that this discreteness, you can think of a discretization because if the low level processing is continuous, um, which, we, you know, like in current deep learning, and at some point there is some discretization, for example, in the communication between those brain modules that we see in the global workspace theory, uh, so it's not only that it goes through a bottleneck where very few variables are being uh, going through that, but also these variables have been mostly discretized. Uh, and, uh, and when we hypothesize that, this also helps a form of systematic generalization. When we discretize, it makes it easier for different brain modules to talk the same language um, and to be kind of hot swappable one for the other. So for example, I can replace a noun by another in a sentence. Maybe different parts of my brain are um, uh, dealing with different kinds of nouns, but, but because we discretize, uh, we can share attributes, like being a noun, for example, uh, is an attribute um, that, that, um, that, that, that allow this, uh, this global communication to, um, to be easier and, and um, and, and enable this kind of systematic generalization we see in language. All right, another assumption, another inductive bias is 
on the nature of intervention. So again, we can think of interventions as just abstract actions. By opposition to low-level actions like controlling a particular muscle, uh, a high-level action is something that you can name in language very easily, like you know, drop something. Um, so that's an intervention. And you will notice that most uh, verbs right, that have to do with interventions typically um, can you know, happily apply to a single object. So, um, and, and, and this is an assumption people, you know, that you find in, in the, the theories around causality, that a, 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 a sort of the prototypical intervention, and then you know, we can generalize a bit, but the prototypical intervention focuses on a single object Right, I'm gonna drop the phone that's here, right? One thing. And then of course it can have consequences of many other things. Uh, open the floodgates, if, if I can say so. Uh, and, and this gives rise to also a different picture about how to learn these um, high level representations. A lot of the work that's being done in deep learning um, and the representation learning part of deep learning is, is purely focused on perception where, okay, so we're going to try to learn a mapping from low level pixels to these high level abstract objects. Lots and lots of work in computer vision these days uh, on that theme. But then you have the uh, reinforcement learning gang and they're trying to learn these high level abstract actions you know, called options. Uh, and it's like two different worlds that don't talk to each other, but Actually, they should be intimately tied because the abstract actions, they are targeted to a single object usually. And you know, maybe you don't succeed to push exactly that glass. Maybe you know, you're touching other things and other things fall. But, but the intention is often to just control one thing. So we should learn both at the same time. We should learn the abstract actions and the abstract objects. Uh, and abstract events and entities uh, jointly. And that means we, we should not be learning from static data. We should learn from environments where the learner uh, can act and can see the effect of their action and can uh, you know, connect the action space and the uh, object space in a natural way. Okay. So now I'm gonna zip through a number of papers from my group and, and, and uh, others uh, that touch upon these ideas. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to share my, my slides. So don't, don't worry if it goes too quickly. Um, you, can, you can dig uh, in these papers later. So, so one paper um, uh, I wanna mention first is an iClear 2020 paper called a meta-transfer objective for learning to disentangle causal mechanisms. And um, it's about a very simple scenario of just learning whether A causes B or B causes A, but where uh, we're trying to find uh, how, uh, you know, with what principles, at least we introduce one new principle by which a learner could answer these kinds of questions if, if they don't know ahead of time. And, um, and the idea is that when you have the right causal model and the right abstract representation, um, adaptation to a change in distribution due to an intervention is gonna be easy. It's going to be easy because the change in your model can be localized to just one small part of it. Let me give you the example of the baby with the sunglasses. So, uh, if I put sunglasses, everything at the pixel level changes. It's like the distribution is completely different. And if I had to relearn about this at that level of representation, it would be terrible. It would take a lot of time to like recalibrate everything in my visual system. But fortunately, we have this high level of representation where um, maybe we have learned or maybe we can learn that there is this binary variable that is have I put uh, sunglasses or not? And, um, and you know, that one bit is the explanation for the change. So I don't need to change so many things. Uh, I can discover this one bit quickly. I can uh, uh, infer its value quickly. Um, so if I can work at this high level uh, adaptation 
to these changes in distribution become much easier. And you can actually use that to figure out what is a good representation and, um, and, and how are these cause variables related to each other? Is A cause of B or B cause of A? Um, and, and so that's what this paper does. Um, and then a few other papers by Kay and Bouillard extend these ideas um, to not just true variables, but you know, any, gra any causal graph. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the details of that, but the challenge here when you have uh, larger uh, causal graphs uh, is the number of possible graphs, instead of being just two or three, you know, A causes B or B causes A or none of the above, um, is exponential in, in the size of the, of the graph. So how could we discover that? Like, how do we search in that exponential space? So we can parameterize the, our belief over all these causal graphs by looking at each edge separately and say, what's the probability of this variable being a direct causal parent of this variable? And then uh, we can come up with um, estimators of the gradient of these uh, belief parameters. So that's what we've done there. And it, it kind of beats the existing methods on causal discovery. Um, and that work is continuing and, and a more recent paper, we show that you can get the, that uh, causal, discovery to, causal discovery to be much more efficient, much, much more efficient if the learner can intentionally explore, like decide what intervention. So in the previous work that I mentioned, the learner is, is sort of passively seeing these changes in distribution due to interventions. But what if the learner, like a child playing, chooses you know, what to try next and see what the consequences are? Well, it, it completely changes the game and it makes learning much more efficient. Um, so like the orange line converges to better results much faster than the blue line, which we, we don't see the end of this, but it's very, it would be very slow otherwise. Um, We've worked also on uh, this uh, hypothesis from the global workspace theory that says that knowledge is partitioned into pieces corresponding to, in the brain, to little modules that compete with each other. They compete for what could go into the global workspace. They compete for explaining what is in the input. So a first paper on this is called the Recurrent Independent Mechanisms and published at this year's iClear but actually, you know, we wrote this uh, two years earlier. Um, and uh, another uh, aviation lab theme uh, is under submission, um, uh, explicitly forces the communication between those modules to go through a, a kind of a, a set uh, memory, like a workspace, um, which is, is a concept that has been become popular in um, many, uh, modern deep learning architectures that use attention. Uh, and, and that helps quite a bit with out of distribution generalization. And we've applied this to a number of architectures, including transformers. So for example, in the transformer, instead of each stage communicating to the next stage in a completely like free for all way where any element in the previous stage can be used as an input for any element of the next stage, we force uh, a bottleneck where only a few elements in the previous stage are allowed to go through that bottleneck. So it's the shared workspace. Um, and of course, the, uh, we learn the attention mechanism which chooses what to pay attention from the previous stage. Um, uh, yeah, let me skip that. And, and uh, another like uh, recently submitted paper uh, going in a similar direction uh, focuses on the question of attention uh, isn't just about which element to focus on, but also which mechanism, which rule, which piece of knowledge, stationary piece of knowledge, is to be applied. And, uh, and we call that paper Neural Production Systems because uh, it's very much inspired by the you know, old AI production system, except everything is neural nets and attention all the way. But, but it has this flavor that um, computation um, is uh, going through a sequence of stages. Each stage is the application of a rule that's been selected by attention, but we also have a sort of a double attention where we also select the arguments of that rule uh, from the working memory, and then the rule produces more things to put in the working memory. Um, and um, yeah, that, 
there's the discrete value neural communication that I mentioned. Um, again, uh, this is a recently submitted paper that you can find on archive. Um, and again, we, we find this, this, and you know, it's not obvious how to do discretization in a neural net because you need to backprop through that. So there are different schemes that, that people have come up with and we show some schemes that work well. Um, so I'm close to uh, finishing. Um, and um, let me say a few words, uh, maybe looking forward about the things we're planning to do or working on, but, but still kind of uh, in construction. Um, so if you look at reasoning the way humans do it, there is something really incredible about it, um, especially very different from the way classical AI envisions reasoning. So the, the classical way of thinking about reasoning and sort of symbolic systems is uh, anchored on the search. Um, you know, you can, if you want to prove a theorem, there, there are many existing theorems that you could uh, apply at any point, and, and uh, they form a graph of all the ways you could plan a solution to a problem. Uh, so planning in general, right, is uh, and reasoning are kind of two of, you know, more or less the same thing. Um, and the problem with planning and reasoning is there's an exponential number of things you could consider. But think about what's going on in a system like AlphaGo. We train a neural net to cut that search and propose good candidates in one shot. And if you think about your own mind, in your own imagination, it seems to proceed very much like this. Uh, well, at least uh, I don't know about you, but but I get these solutions or at least candidate solutions to problems that just pop in my mind. If I search, I mean, if I think about a problem, solutions just pop. I mean, sometimes they don't work and sometimes nothing comes, but they do come, and that's how I you know do my research. Um, so we have this imagination machine that's essentially system one because I can't peer into it. I just get the solutions. Like I know, I think I know this is a good thing to do. And and um, and then of course I can try to reason about it. I can decompose it into small pieces and maybe see that my idea for proving a theorem makes sense because I can check each step and so on. So that's more like the, the usual system two um, coherence checking ability. But where do these candidates come from. They come from a generative model that proposes solutions. Um, and, um, and you can think of our current ways of doing attention as uh, a baby step in that direction because it's about making choices. But how do we make like a um, combinatorial set of choices? Like, you know, you have many rules you can combine and, and each of them, you have to choose which arguments, you know, what's uh, how they connect to each other to come up with a plan or a solution to a problem. And, and the way I, 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 uh, I envision this is a sort of a graph that, that's constructed dynamically and that is a proposed candidate for uh, solving a problem, maybe doing a counterfactual, like imagining things that could have happened in the past and so on. So, so that's the sort of thing uh, we're trying to do these days. Um, and now uh, to finish, I want to maybe clarify how the sort of plan that I'm, I've tried to outline differs from the both the, the classical symbolic AI program and a lot of the um, uh, proposals that I've seen lying around of hybrid systems where you maybe have uh, like a low level uh, deep learning like system and then it, you know, we discretize the output and it becomes symbols and then it's all like classical AI. I don't think that picture works for a number of reasons, but, but so let's see first, what's the difference with the uh, classical uh, AI um, sort of real based symbol manipulation approach. Um, so, so these systems have issues that um, uh, modern deep learning, you know, machine learning based approaches have allowed to go around. Um, 
we want to keep those advantages of current deep learning, like efficient, large-scale learning, semantic grounding in uh, you know system one with implicit knowledge of things like perception and low-level action. The notion of representation of entities, not as symbols, but as uh, vectors, as, as distributed representations with multiple attributes that are learned. That is very powerful for generalization, as we've as we've seen, even in language modeling, which should be like old symbols, that this representation aspect is is really what makes the huge difference between um, classical, even statistical um, natural language uh, methods and and modern machine learning for natural language. And then there's the point I was raising about the search problem, uh, where you you just can't you know. The, do the full search, exhaustive searches, it doesn't work. Uh, so we, we need to learn to propose good solutions. And, and that's going to come from system one. It's going to come from these generative deep nets that somehow learn uh, to infer uh, what would be a good explanation, what would be a good plan, and so on. And, and then finally, it, it was kind of hard to, to incorporate probability into the classical ways of thinking, although it has been done uh, with things like uh, Markov logic networks, for example, but in modern machine learning, this is much more um, convenient. Okay, so, but we also wanna draw from the classical AI um, uh, features that, that are uh, shared with you know, human thinking, like systematic generalization, uh, decomposing knowledge into these small exchangeable pieces and being able to uh, manipulate these high level variables, uh, making a difference between variables like the arguments of these rules and mechanisms and instances. Like in program, we have the arguments of a function uh, when we define the function, these are the variables, but then we instantiate these arguments with you know real objects in memory that are gonna be uh, computed over. And, and that brings notion of, of references and interaction, which of course are all over the place in classical programming, but that we need to uh, bring into the fold of uh, modern machine learning and neural nets. And I think it's completely feasible. Um, and uh, that's what I'm after. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna be very happy to answer questions now. Um, uh, yes, here I am. Uh, thank you, thank you, Joshua, for this uh, exciting and I am pretty sure everyone in the audience would agree. Very thought-provoking talk. Um, so the first question that is most upvoted is um, a controversial one, let's say. So. Um, what is your opinion on the statement, I believe, from DeepMind paper that reward is enough? And to achieve algorithm generalization, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, um, I do. So I think I, I agree and I disagree with that statement. Let me clarify. So, so of course, at, at some scale, like evolutionary scale, Reward is enough. It's like evolutionary fitness, right? Survival, reproduction, um, at least in the animal world, right? Uh, or the uh, living world. Um, so it's everything is derived from that. Everything, our intelligence and, and so on is derived from that. But I don't want to wait like a billion years to build the AI. Yeah, that's long. So, so, so that's the sense in which I disagree with reward is enough. Mm -hmm. like, no, it's not enough. I think we need to be smart and bypass, you know, these billions of years of evolution and maybe, you know, look at inspiration from humans. Like what sort of tricks, heuristics, if you want inductive biases, uh, priors, you know, you can, you can choose your word. Uh, can we throw in that will, um, you know, uh, that have been constructed by nature through evolution, but but are going to allow us to quickly build machines that do at least as well as humans, right? Um, and so, so that's the sense in which I disagree. And I think we do need to pay attention to not just the, this ultimate reward. Uh, 
uh, and even in the world of rewards, like which rewards? Like you know, there's the ultimate reward like of, of fitness. Yeah. But but uh, but in practice, the way people use RL is they design rewards. That's like engineering. Okay, it's, it's there's a lot of prior knowledge there too. Now, which prior knowledge do we want to put in? And that's kind of a very interesting question. When in the '90s, I was a big proponent of the tabula rasa view of machine learning, but of course. Then mm -hmm. came the a no free lunch theorem that says there is no such thing as completely tabula rasa machine learning. You need to throw in some assumptions. Um, and and so so then what should we do? Well, I think um, it's something like this. We want the most general inductive bias. That's like, in other words, very few bits of information that buy you the most in generalization for the problems we care about. The problems we care about, like say, as like the problems that humans solve. Like, you know? um, so it's not zero, but it's epsilon, and it's not any epsilon. It's one that has to do with uh, the kind of universe in which humans live, because uh, at least that's our first target for intelligent systems. <laughs> that's a good target. Uh, thank you. Um... The second uh, most important question is um, some research suggests that babies learn through causality, uh, about causality through experimentation. Um, and what are your thoughts on the role of motivation in this process and potential inductive biases behind it? Yeah, yeah. I, I love very much um, Alison Gopnik's uh, work and, and others uh, that have been pursuing similar goals in, in development science and cognitive science. And um, in fact, what I talked about in my presentation uh, included that message that uh, you probably can't discover how the world works in a purely passive way. Or if you can, it's going to be, you know, you're going to need a lot of data, like lot, 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 lot more than we can probably afford, even with, you know, all the text and, the, and, and the, that humans are produced. Um, so I don't think like GPT-X is going to cut it because it doesn't interact with the world, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's always going to get better as you have more data and bigger models, but it's not going to it's going to it's not going to approach the human level of understanding um, because you can get and, and some of the experiments I mentioned where we see when the learner is allowed to intervene, like the child choosing what to play with and to, where to explore the learner in an active way. Right, The learner can uh, be much more efficient in, in knowledge acquisition in that yeah. way. In a low dimensional space, it doesn't matter. You can do random search, but think about like discovering uh, some of the subtle laws of physics uh, through random experimentation. It's not going to work, right? You, you have to plan your experiments. Like that's what modern science does in biology and physics and chemistry and so on. Um, you can't just count on luck and you know moving around around and then discovering uh, particles or something. So, um, yeah, experimentation is super important. And now motivation, it's the internalization of this um, uh, internal reward that makes us, you know, want to search things that can bring us information. Um, it's not the only reward. But, but it's a very powerful one, and it's one that drives a lot of uh, what's going on with children um, or scientists. Um, so yeah, motivation uh, for humans is important, and we haven't really thought much about it in machines, but I think uh, the work in unsupervised reinforcement learning is, mm -hmm. is trying to do something similar. Right. And right. inductive okay. biases will be necessary, like beyond the idea that you need such a reward. Like how is it structured? What, what are we after? How do we structure knowledge and so on? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's very interesting. Um, for anyone interested in the audience, uh, there's a great docu-series on Netflix on how babies learn. Highly recommended. Um, so um, the next question is, more about being a scientist than uh, research per se. So the question is, uh, what are your recommendations for students starting in the field to have a successful academic career while avoiding typical pressures, such as publishing quickly, uh, achieving state-of-the-art results using much compute and things like that? Yeah. I know it's difficult. Um, even in places like Mila, where we are reasonably well-funded and um, it's a, um, 
you know, favorable environment in many, many ways for academia. Um, I see students under huge pressure. And it's funny because I, I didn't feel that pressure when I was grad students, or even if I look at my own students in the 90s, right. it, it wasn't there. Um, so something has changed. I think something has changed in society in general. Like if you look around, people are more stressed and working more hours and it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, but, but I think in machine learning in particular, why it has changed like this, um, maybe because of the fact that machine learning is deployed in industry and you can now earn a lot more depending on how well you do in your, in your PhD. Whereas you know, in my days, you're lucky if you find a, a job in your area. Um, doing mm -hmm. like these crazy academic stuff. So um, how do we deal with this? Uh, I think we need to be part of, I mean, like everybody needs to be part of the discussion. I don't have like a, a magical answer, but but you know, recognizing there is an issue and, and recognizing that it goes against the progress of science. It goes against the mental health of researchers at all levels, by, by the way, like young professors also like they're under humongous pressure uh, to, to get tenure, right? Um, yeah. so, um, the publishing, publisher parish thing is, is really bad for science because, you know, you cut corners, you do things that are not reproducible, you do things that are even wrong, or you waste your time on incremental work. And I can tell you that the time of your PhD is the time when you can do the, the deepest thought because you you're supposed to be focusing on one thing. And when you get to be a professor, if you, if you do, you're going to be working on 10 different things in parallel. And it gets hard to have as much uh, depth because of uh, we can't focus as much as, as professors, at least, mm -hmm. uh, you know, d depending on what style of research you do. Um, so, so you need to preserve that and it's precious. At the same time, not saying you, you shouldn't publish because it's going to be a problem afterwards. And even for your thesis, you need some papers, right? Um, but I see many of my students and, and others at Mila like graduating with like 10 papers, um, even more. Like, what? <laughs> so <laughs> you don't need that many. Uh, two or three is enough for a thesis. Uh, but, you know, make them good, right? Um, and, but I, like, it's easy for me to say those things. Um, it's it's hard uh, when you're living under those competitive pressures to resist it. But I can tell you, it's going to help if you do if you do resist. You're going to be able to um, be among the ones who can come up with the more original ideas that have been thought through more carefully and can be more transformative. And at the end, that you know might be. Um, what distinguishes you from 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 others? Um, yeah, stuff. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I think these are very useful pieces of advice that I hope the audience will find useful as well. Um, so the next question, I think we have time for like maybe two. Um, so this is more about neuroscience. Um, this is a, I guess, both way uh, street. So the question is, what do you think people studying consciousness should focus on? So like neuroscientists, what lines of research are you most excited and what are the new yeah. findings? Well, first of all, um, neuroscientists have been the first scientists of all science to dare study consciousness and they should get you know uh, rewards for that because I think it's important. Um, I feel like the, the, the study of consciousness uh, is, is sort of in a phase, similar a phase transition um, that, you know, we could use an analogy to um, life, the notion of life and life sciences. So you know, a couple of centuries ago, the notion of life was shrouded in almost mystical and religious mystery. And, you know, there was this maybe uh, principle of things that are alive, they're like special. They have maybe a soul or something. And, um, but then slowly, you know, chemists and biologists have uh, figured out the mechanisms behind, uh, you know, uh, behind biology, behind life. 
And it's and the more we understand that, the more the mystery goes away and we don't need to even think about it uh, in the ways that we used to. But I think consciousness is a bit like this. Right now we understand it so poorly that it feels magical and especially because there's a subjective aspect to it. So, um, uh, but, but if you, if you study, uh, what has been done in the last like 20, 30 years in neuroscience and, and cognitive science, it, it, it's changing the game. And, and, and now it's a, you know, it's a legit thing to study. And it's an important thing to study because among, uh, well, at least according to me, it's important because it's a key to upcoming advances in AI. So it's key to philosophy is key to humanities and social sciences because it's about who we are, like what does it mean to be human? But it's also key for uh, functional reasons. Like now it's not like consciousness is here for a reason. Evolution has put it in us mm -hmm. because it helps us to solve problems better, right? That's the perspective at least I've chosen. And if we understand those mechanisms better, Okay, so, so to answer your question now more directly, work with people in AI, like work with people who can uh, experiment with theories that could explain human consciousness by running machine learning simulations that would embody those theories and verify if they buy something um, in the sense that they you know, give you better generalization and, and so on. So uh, that would be my suggestion. And, uh, and you know, on my side, I'm, I'm connecting with neuroscientists and philosophers to you know, put our minds together into this uh, big problem. Right, that sounds, that sounds very exciting. Um, okay, so let me look at the, oh, this is, uh, so um, the question is, what are your favorite ideas in the so-called good old-fashioned AI? And do you think any of them in particular should be brought into the spotlight and brought back to deep learning? Yeah, that was, that was a big theme of my talk. Uh, so what, what ideas? Uh, I had a slide like at the end, right? So um, breaking knowledge into recombinable pieces. If you think about facts and rules, that's exactly what it is. And a good, uh, sort of knowledge representation is breaking that knowledge into not just exchangeable pieces, like I can you know combine these things in many new yeah. ways, but also if one of the pieces turned out to be wrong, I don't need to rewrite my whole code. My whole code. When you write code, you try to do that. Like you try to design your code so that the pieces are sort of independent of the others, as in I can change how it's done. Or I can even change the semantics, and then I need to change mm -hmm. how you know it's connected to other pieces of code. But but roughly speaking, I try to factorize so that they are independent, and that's actually an idea from causality um, uh, that's more recent, like uh, trying to formalize that notion mathematically in terms of information theory. Um, so that's one aspect, like knowledge representation, and and I don't say that it applies to everything. I say it applies to high level knowledge of the kind we verbalize, reason with, and so on. So don't try to redo the visual system or like covenants with mm -hmm. this. Right. Try to fix the problem of like manipulating high level knowledge, planning, reasoning at the causal level and so on. Second thing, um, um, indirection, right? So, uh, you know, the notion of variable and value, the notion of uh, arguments and instances and so on, uh, you, you know, it's sort of, it's it's also in programming, not just in classical AI, uh, but you know classical AI, AI yeah. has has exploited that. You have recursion, um, you have the same piece of code or knowledge that you can reuse over and over and or recombine in new ways. Um, so we we don't have that in classical neural net. So if you think about a classical neural net, it's like you have a fixed function. The first layer is composed with another fixed function. The second layer is composed with a fixed function of the third layer. But now with attention mechanism, we start to be able to do something more like, um, you know, what we find in classical AI, where we say, oh, I'm going to choose which function to apply first and then which one second. And we, okay, so you see, we're getting closer to that, but I think we can do more. For example, um, the notion of having 
uh, reusable pieces, like these rules are like reusable pieces, but instead of a symbolic rule, it could be an MLP. It could be like a little piece of parameterized thing that you're going to learn. Uh, but it has this notion that it has arguments and on the fly, I'm going to decide what this piece of code, this function, this mechanism is going to be aligned to this in order to answer such question and so on. So, so yeah, I, I think that we can import a lot of import, important yeah. concepts like this from classical AI, but but hoping you can take your old code and just stick it on top of neural nets. That's just put it in the garbage bin. <laughs> that's that's exciting and um, many ideas for the audience to pursue. I guess this field is quite underexplored. Um, okay. Um, Maybe you last one. Um, okay, this one can be interpreted in a few ways. Um, so people have multiple cognitive biases. Some are reasonable, uh, some are definitely not, like that $8.99 is cheaper than $9. Um, but all are coming from evolutionary pressures. They exist for a reason. Um, so should deep models learn shortcuts as humans do, or is it a bug? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use um, an analogous question that comes from how neural net research has, you know, the relationship between neural net research and neuroscience. So, so a lot of neuroscience is uh, descriptive. Like we observe this, and you know, we we have theories about you know, these types of neurons communicate in this way, and we have these chemicals, and you know, um, it's not about the why; it's about you know what we observe, the how, um, and and similarly, cognitive scientists are observing inductive, I mean, biases of humans. Uh, um, and sometimes they, you know, by definition, first of all, a lot of inductive biases um, will be appropriate in some contexts, the ones where, you know, evolution, you know, made them appear, but fail in other contexts. That's, that's like by definition what an inductive bias is. Like it, it makes you do the right thing in the context where it's appropriate, and it's, these are usually the contexts where evolution, you know, made those come up. But but then you can do like stupid things outside. So why do I say all this? Uh, first of all, it's not like there are like good ones and bad ones. There are ones that are appropriate in different contexts, and maybe like we evolved in uh, social environments and physical environments right. different, and you know we're all stressed for the wrong reasons. For example, like it's just that mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense. It's coming back to the previous question. Um, so we need to understand what, from a, from a computer science point of view, from an AI point of view, for each of these inductive biases, we need to have a, like a theory, like why is it useful? And if we can mm -hmm. understand that, at least you know, come up with an explanation for this, a theory, then we can say, well, is it something we want to have in the machines that we want to build for you know, this and that? So it basically be rational about it. Not just, so going back to neuroscience, the mistake, uh, would be, I think, for deep learning and neural nets to say, oh, we see this phenomenon in neurons, but just stick it in and hope that it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could try and just see experimentally, you know, machine learning experiments. And some of the things I've done, for example, the, uh, uh, the rectifier, the, you know, ReLU, that's how it came about. We thought, oh, like these, these neuroscientists, they, they use this funny nonlinearity. Um, should we try it in uh, mm -hmm. deep in, in uh, MLPs? Oh, God, it works incredibly well. We can train deep yeah. nets with this. Uh, and we still don't have an explanation. Well, okay, so that's the counter example. The better thing to do is to understand what you're doing because otherwise there are so many pieces, so many details, whether it's in cognitive science or even worse in neuroscience, you can't just try to put these things together and hope that it's going to work. Um, and I have like another like little story to illustrate this. Imagine... This is a story from Jeff Hinton. Um, mm -hmm. You are aliens and you're observing uh, the planet from higher up in you know, uh, your, your uh, vessels. And, and you see all of these beings moving around the planet. And uh, it seems that, like there's a dominant species 
And actually, they are the cars, right? Like they, the humans are small little things that are around the cars. So first of all, there's like wrong interpretation because you think that the bigger things are more important. Mm -hmm. And and also, okay, so you think that the aliens may think, all right, so we're going to try to replicate those those cars to understand how they work. So they build a model car. Uh, and based on like all the pictures they have, they try to reproduce things like the leather on, on the seats and things like this and, and the colors and the shapes. Uh, but they don't get the, um, the, uh, the motor because <laughs> it's kind of hidden. But without the motor, of course, when they turn on the key, it never works. Right. So what I'm trying to say is you need to understand what you're doing. Otherwise, it's probably going to be useless.